Okay. So, hi everybody again. Welcome to this paper session on Web 3D 2021. And uh, here we have three interesting papers. First one, supporting web-based collaboration for construction site monitoring. Second one, Resurrect 3D, an open and customable platform for visualizing and analyzing cultural heritage artifacts. Uh, and the last one, how long we want to maintain these things, understand the challenges faced by web XR creators. So uh, we start uh, with the first paper. Uh, the speaker is uh, Andreas Dietzke from the Fulda University of Applied Sciences. And uh, okay, we can uh, start. Hello to everyone. Hello and welcome to our presentation with the title Supporting Web-Based Collaboration for Construction Site Monitoring. My name is Andreas Dietze and I'm a PhD student from Fulda University in Hessen, Germany. My research fields are computer graphics, extended reality, computer vision and web technology. The presentation agenda exists of a short introduction into digital construction site monitoring including a demo video of our system and an overview about the state of the art and our system pipeline. Followed by this, the difference detection, the representation of these differences, the web-based collaboration and a conclusion are addressed. So the background is to deal with the problem that the coordination and monitoring of construction sites is very complex and time consuming. This leads to the problem that errors or deviations from the planning data are discovered often too late, which can result in high follow-up costs or endangerous adherence to the schedule. And this is where digital construction site monitoring using augmented reality can be very useful. First, it is still an open research topic due to the constant improvements and enhancements in augmented and mixed reality technology and measurements of the air spill state in form of a 3D reconstruction can be used to detect errors or deviations at an early stage by a comparison with the planning data. Identified errors or deviations can also be used to update the planning data if they are within tolerance, which allows a synchronization between the planning and measurement data. This also involves modernizations or redesigns of existing buildings, like the installation of new doors or the ceiling of old ones. Finally, deviations can be visualized on several clients, which provides a collaboration between all stakeholders to, su to support decision-making processes. And in this regard, we made a little demo video. First, the data acquisition by our 3D reconstruction is done for a comparison with the planning data. Once the comparison is done, the differences are represented in form of an augmented reality visualization and a system-independent web-based representation, which is shown here on top of the augmented reality visualization. Next to the web-based representation, a live view from the HoloLens is sent to the connected web clients. Unfortunately, when simultaneously recording with the native device portal, a second camera stream from the webcam doesn't work, so the live frame is restricted to the AR rendering. To mark the differences of interest, the differences can be selected in the AR and web client and are highlighted between all collected clients to the back end. As related work, for example, Dobos et al. is to mention, who described a method that recognizes differences between 3D models in the screen space and visualizes them for the user. To determine differences, various data like color, depth, normals, and texture coordinates are compared within the screen space to determine whether there, is, whether there are changes and what kind of changes are involved. Also to mention is Tudas et al, whose approach compares point clouds from real schemes with planning data in order to enable an automated building documentation. The point clouds are recorded using photogrammetry and structure from motion. 
For the comparison, the recorded point cloud and the planning data model are inserted into a voxel grid to decide whether there are any deviations between the data based on the distance between the points and the model. An unified XR content representation and cross-environment rendering method for the web is introduced in Lee et al., which uses an HTML extension that provides text for creating XR content that is displayed in the browser. In Grandi et al., a comparison of collaborative 3D tasks between asymmetric VR-VR, asymmetric AR-AR, and one asymmetric VR-AR collaborative, collaborative environment is presented. The evaluation showed that a collaboration in the symmetrical VR environment outperforms the other symmetric AR environment as well as slightly the asymmetric VR-AR environment due to the more intuitive interaction with the VR controllers. A, a web-based mixed reality tool for construction planning and supervision is presented in Edsold et al. Here a use case is described how people from different devices at different locations can use the tool for collaborative aspects by supporting a shared view of the current state of a construction project using photo collections. So, to provide an overview of how our system works, we made an overview which illustrates the whole system pipeline. On the left side, the 3D planning data and measurement data in form of a 3D reconstruction is shown, which are used for the comparison. Once the comparison is done and the 3D planning data has been updated based on the detected differences, the system provides a web-based and system-independent representation of the results using the XFreedom framework as illustrated in the middle. This visualization consists of the used data sets, which are the original planning data, the updated planning data, and an overlay of them. Within the main view, these states can be toggled and additionally, the respective wireframe and the detected differences are visualized. Next to the render area on the right side of the figure, a numeric and interactable representation of the differences is shown. For example, if a specific field within the table is selected, the associated rendered differences, difference also will be highlighted. In the bottom right corner, an augmented reality visualization of the measurement data and differences is illustrated, which we can be also streamed to the web front end and within the next slides we will take a deeper look how the individual steps are done. So next we take a look at the comparison between the measurement and the planning data and how the differences are determined and used to perform an error correction by updating the planning data based on the detected differences. In case of planning data acquisition, a 3D model of the planning data is either available or can, uh, can be extruded from the ground plans outline using a, specif a specific tool for this purpose in our system or by using third-party software like Blender or Photoshop. The measurement data can be obtained either by a model-based approach like Microsoft HoloLens does. Uh, model-based in this case means that the 3D reconstruction results in a complete 3D cut model instead of a raw point cloud. Or it also could be used uh, the uh, raw point cloud data. In case of the planning data segmentation, the 2D ground plan is used and converted into a point cloud. The segmentation is done by use of a Euclidean cluster extraction, which results in one ground segment and a cluster of wall segments, as illustrated at the bottom. Based on the extracted wall cluster, we are also able to locate and measure window and door objects by finding the both nearest neighbors of each wall segment, which are connected by blue lines within the figure at the bottom. In addition, this provides adjacency information for the wall, window and door objects. Furthermore, a segmentation and extraction based on the ground plan point cloud also provides the location of a segmented object in 3D space. The location and length of the found elements in the planning data are the base for the later comparison with segmented elements from the measurement data. The figure on the right shows the overlay of the extracted elements from the planning data within the point cloud of the measurement data. 
for the segmentation of measurement data, the point cloud is first cleaned up by removing outliers that are not part of the room. Based on an autographic projection of the point cloud along the respective coordinate plane xy, xz or yz, a mass histogram is created as shown on the left. In the next step, outliers are identified by the first and second amplitude in the mass histogram and are subsequently removed or better said cut off before the first and after the second amplitude. This technique also enables a segmentation of entire wall sites which are used to identify door or window elements within the actual data. The localization and segmentation of, wall, of window and door elements within the actual data is performed out using alpha shapes, which are primarily used to extract the concave hull of a planar point cloud, but also can be used to find openings in a planar point cloud, as shown in, fi in the figure at the bottom. An overlay of all extracted object, objects from the planning and measurement data, including the crown plan, is visualized in the bottom right. To update the 3T planning data based on the detected differences, vertices which are relevant for a manipulation have to be located. This is achieved within four steps based on an overlay of the 3T planning data point cloud and the point cloud of the crown plan as shown in the bottom left. First, rectangular intersection shapes are set up at a connection point of a window or door object to its correlated wall segment and secondly, vertices of the original 3D planning data are located within the intersection shapes. Green intersection shapes belong to a start point of a window or door and the green vertices detected within belongs to a wall connected to that window or door. The same it is for the red intersection shapes and vertices but they belong to an endpoint of a window or door object. Purple vertices are not relevant for a, for a manipulation. Based on the width difference of the extracted objects from the planning and measurement data, which we can see in the right table, all detected vertices next to a start or an endpoint are manipulated based on the determined deviations on this side respectively. Finally, the updated cut file is saved persistently and can be visualized using an application-dependent visualization which has no annotation or other information about the differences. Okay, so we now have our differences detected and updated the 3D planning data based on them and in the next part we take a look at the representation of the differences which consists of a web-based difference representation and an augmented reality difference visualization. When exporting the updated planning data, the system also creates a web frontend for a system-independent presentation of the difference detection result using the XFreedom framework for the rendering. The result page consists of several views which are used for the individual datasets. Within the first view of the area marked with 1, the original 3D planning data is visualized. The view marked with 2 consists of the uploaded up, uh, updated planning data and next to it, marked with 3, the updated planning data is rendered on top of the original planning data. Below the top area, the main view marked with 4 is located. Within it, the different datasets can be rendered separately and it offers several other features, like rendering also the wireframe or only the differences which are interactable. This means that an interaction with a 3D difference within the main view or the respective table element, marked with 5, representing this difference will highlight the 3D element as well as the table item and vice versa. When, connecting, when connected to the backend, it is also possible to get a live view from the person's view at the construction site using the HoloLens, which is marked with 7 and embedded in the user interface marked with 6 to control the main view. As mentioned, display, the display data within the main view can be toggled. In addition, when also rendering the 3D element representing the determined difference, this annotates whether this difference is an extension, which is, which is the case if a difference is visible when rendering the original planning data, or a reduction if the difference is visible and the updated planning data is rendered. It is also possible to render the point cloud used for the difference detection, including the wireframe of the original or updated planning data, and the differences, so all visible elements can be rendered separately or together in all variations. The total differences and differences of the respective wall sites are also represented in form of a table, 
both the table elements and the corresponding 3D differences are interactable. So an interaction with a table element highlights the 3D difference and vice versa, as shown on the right and at the bottom. Besides the visualization of differences using augmented reality, or our augmented reality frontend offers several other services. First, there is the measurement data acquisition to mention, and the acquired data can be saved locally on the device or can be sent to the backend. Determined differences can be visualized and are also interactable, which allows a selection of the difference of interest. This information, as well as a live stream from the augmented reality frontend, can then be shared via the backend to all other connected web frontends. The next part of this presentation consists of the use of our proposed system in terms of a web-based collaboration and is divided into our collaborative environment, some use cases and details about how the web service and communication between all clients work. Our collaborative environment exists of the HoloLens AR frontend, the web frontend using Xfreedom, and a Node.js backend which provides the difference detection as a web service in form of a Node.js module. Based on the service which the environment currently offers, we implemented three use cases. Within the first use case, the user is using existing data from the database or uploads new data to the backend and triggers the web service by a web frontend. The system then performs the difference detection and sends the result page back to the user. This, for example, is especially useful for a remote user at home or at an office, like an engineer or project owner, and due to its web-based difference representation, it can be used on any device. In the second use case, the user is physically on the construction site and uses the AR frontend, first to capture new measurement data, and secondly, to visualize the result from the difference detection performed by the web service in form of an augmentation. The third use case combines both front ends to allow a collaboration using the different front ends. For example, user A is at the construction site using the AR front end, and user B and C are connected to the back end by web front ends. Instead of using pre scanned measurement data from the database, the currently captured data from user A can be also used. In addition, the AR front end is able to stream a live view from user A to the connected web clients. Um, yes, determined differences are visualized within our frontends, and any interaction with a certain difference will be highlighted within the other frontends. So, technically seen, the difference detection web service is a C++ Node.js server add-on, which allows the use of native C++ application applications as a web service. For the communication be between the backend and our clients, we used a REST API and WebSockets. The REST API is primarily used for the data exchange of the planning and measurement data when, for example, uploading newly acquired measurement data to the backend or to get pre-recorded data from the backend. The result of the difference detection is also provided via the REST API. In case of the AR frontend using newly acquired measurement data, the difference detection result consists of JSON data, which provides the position and dimensions of the detected differences based on the existing AR session. For the web front ends, the result exists in form of a newly created HTML file containing the difference detection result. All interactions in form of selecting differences of interests are transmitted by WebSocket as well as the video stream from the HoloLens is first sent to the backend and then broadcasted to all connected web front ends. The last part of the presentation consists of a conclusion which is divided into a summary and the future work. To summarize, we described a system to support web-based construction site monitoring by automatically detect differences between a 3D reconstruction and the corresponding planning data. In addition, the original 3D planning data cut can be updated based on the detected differences if the differences are within tolerance or cannot be corrected. This also involves modernizations or redesigns if, for example, new doors are set or old ones are seed, as illustrated within the pictures at the bottom. Left we can see that the original model has five openings, but the updated cut on the right only has three. This is because the two doors were sealed as part of a redesign and thus the updated 3D planning data represents the real state of the room. The difference detection is provided as standalone C++ application and as a web service via a Node.js server add-on. 
to allow a collaboration between all stakeholders to support decision-making processes in case of a detected difference, a system-independent and web-based representation of the differences using XFreedom as well as a AR, AR front-end for the data acquisition and visualization of detected difference was presented, which allows a cross-device interaction and also a video stream from the AR front-end to the web front-end. Concerning the future work, the height differences are determined but are not yet included in the planning data update. All in all, the prototype is subject to constant further development and further next steps have to have a focus on more complex geometries, since in the actual state it is limited to cuboid building interiors. Another aspect is the integration of our tool to support creating 3D planning data based on the 2D ground plan into our system pipeline as a web service. Here, also a UI which supports a manipulation of the ground plan could be addressed. Also, a support of other AR devices like AR cap-able cap phones and tablets is to mention, which also includes an update from our HoloLens 1 AR front-end to the HoloLens 2. In terms of a difference representation, we want to achieve a more meaningful visualization depending on the respective front-end, especially the AR front-end, which, for example, includes a transmission of the position and orientation from the AR front-end camera to the web front-end. Another subject is a better annotation of differences, for example, if they are too long or too short. At least, the extension of the web frontend by an UI to control the whole pipeline is on our agenda. So, thanks for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, thank you to the author. It's an interesting talk. And, uh, okay, now, question for attenders or from the online chat. If you have something, I can check here. Chat, uh, I think we, uh, if uh, you don't have a question, I have a question, eventually, if I can, okay. So I said it's a very hot topic, uh, but research and industrial applications. But uh, and my question is that the blueprint layout is usually quite different from the point cloud uh, of a real world indoor scene. Okay, since uh, I guess uh, we have a lot of clutter from objects, furniture. Uh, I saw a lot of occlusions uh, in your reconstruction. And from the clutter and the structure itself sometimes, okay. And how do you deal with the occlusion and clutter and the, how the 3D reconstruction is accurate? Um, yes, um, in, in terms of the planning data and uh, uh, 3D point cloud, yes, um, there are for sure not exactly the same, um, this is obvious. Um, but um, in, in terms, you, you uh, have a uh, crown plan often. So this is what you, uh, in, in most any cases, have from the building. And um, uh, by providing the, the planning data um, directly from the, from the floor plan, um, there is a little difference also in, in this type of manner. Um, and uh, mostly we use the uh, crown plan for the segmentation, as we saw in the video. And um, it uh, also uh, offers for, for the visualization. Um, and uh, the second term of your question, sorry, I... Okay, so, okay, yeah, I guess. So you are, you have a front, you have a segmentation module in some way in order to separate the structural part, permanent structural part from uh, the objects and clutter. So that I guess are, are not represented in your blueprints. So, okay, so you have also a segmentation step, okay. Yes. In order, in order to, uh, to figure out uh, out layers and also, okay, uh, yes. objects yes. and more, okay. Yes. And, and okay. you also mentioned um, uh, occlusion. Occlusion, yes. yeah, for even, even self-occlusion, okay. Yes, yes, um, um, we, we also have a little technique for occlusion or um, uh, high specular surfaces, for example. 
and they often cause problems during the reconstruction. And uh, we have a little tool to uh, mark these areas and they are also included in the uh, cleanup process. Um, okay. It's, it's uh, a, a real, uh, a, a big pipeline and uh, it's all fitting not in, in, this, in one paper. So we addressed um, the, or the deeper details, how, uh, for example, uh, uh, we managed the included objects um, is in the related work we also included in the paper. So okay. depending on our earlier work. So uh, there is a focus, of, a deeper focus on the, uh, uh, how the difference detection and all that stuff is uh, done. Okay, fine, thank you. Thank you for your last work. And then uh, you have other uh, questions from audience, online audience. Was a question down in the in the chat, uh, but one of the out uh, already started answering on the on the chat. Uh, yes, can yes. maybe elaborate. Okay, the chat. Uh, yeah, I don't. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm reading, but uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, question is uh, from the audience: uh, Can this be used for external construction sites such as electrical charging station, for example? Uh, yes, as uh, mentioned in the in the chat, um, the the hardware from the Hololens uh, mostly is not yet capable to handle such big dimensions, um, but you can reconstruct it uh, part wise, for example. If this, uh, if I understand the question right. Okay, I, I also see there is the reply in the, in the chat. So okay, so it's a hardware problem. It's still an hardware problem. Okay, so it's for outdoors and more. Okay, uh, fine. Okay, thank you again, Rias. Thank you. And uh, and then we can go to the next paper. Um, the second. Second paper, I see that uh, the author, there is the speaker for the second paper, no? Uh, yes, just uh, pop in, I will promote it as a, as a member. But in the meantime, we can uh, send the, the video. Okay. I just logged in. Welcome. We should uh, come online uh, soon and I will send the video. Hi, hello. Hi, hello. Hello. On Resurrect 3D and open source. Welcome and thank you for attending our presentation on Resurrect 3D, an open source platform for visualizing and analyzing cultural heritage artifacts. First, I'd like to introduce you to my fellow presenters. Yu Hao Zhu, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at the University of Rochester. Josh Romph, uh, Lead Software Engineer of the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Rochester. Elias Newman Donahue, software engineer and student in computer science and history. Famous Clark, software engineer and student in computer science. And Mohammed El Sayed, software engineer and student in electrical and computer engineering and in history. Lastly, I'm Gregory Hayworth. I'm associate professor of English at the University of Rochester, and I direct the Lazarus Project, which is an initiative to uh, recover cultural heritage objects using a variety of imaging techniques. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk to you today about uh, and, uh, is the problems facing humanities uh, researchers and teachers into cultural heritage. Uh, this field faces a, a series of obstacles, whether they be ancient manuscripts, paintings, or artifacts. These cultural heritage objects are often very difficult to work with or teach about because they're complicated, they're detailed, often they're damaged, and they're just generally hard to study in a nuanced way. Over the past decade, researchers and scientists have increasingly been turning to 2D and 3D imaging techniques, such as multispectral or hyperspectral imaging, X-ray fluorescence, IR reflectography, photogrammetry, and reflectance transformation imaging, among others, to capture these difficult to study objects and make them visible to scholars. Uh, but that is only one step uh, on the path to true visibility for cultural heritage. Uh, uh, along the way, the object needs to be analyzed, papers need to be uh, published, 
And then above all, the objects need to be made accessible to a general public in a way that is easy and compelling, that has rich metadata annotations to guide people through, and that accommodates multiple viewing modes in 2D and 3D. Uh, Resurrect 3D uh, is a platform uh, that we're designing to answer to the need of uh, visualizing, studying, and presenting these objects in a truly compelling way. But before I turn the presentation over to my colleagues, I want to give you a sense of the difficulties cultural heritage objects present. The image that you're taking a look at is, uh, of course, Picasso's famous man with the blue guitar, and we all know it as that. What we don't know, uh, usually, is the pentimento that lies beneath it, which was uh, uh, imaged using IR reflectography. What we'd like to be able to do is uh, be able to talk about both images simultaneously and to look at the very specific technical details of painting uh, and of uh, technological recovery that allow us to see two things in one. My next example is uh, the Martellus map. The Martellus map is uh, from about uh, 1491, and it is uh, a map that uh, Columbus consulted before traveling to what ultimately was the New World. It's uh, at Yale's Beinecke Library, and today it exists in a state that is, well, basically illegible. It looks like a large sand dune. Uh, several years ago, the Lazarus, Lazarus Project imaged the map in tiles and uh, image processed uh, it very specifically. We imaged it multispectrally. Uh, and what the images that you're seeing are of one of those tiles, which is the lower right hand uh, um, uh, a frame which describes what's in that map, and you can see the benefit of multispectral imaging. What the general public cannot do, and scholars couldn't do, is to look at the map under various uh, bands and uh, processing uh, versions to be able to uh, transcribe the entire thing and talk about its relationship to other objects. Uh, like the Valzebula map, which is the first map uh, to mention the word America. And this is another example of a complicated, difficult to study object, which uh, Resurrect 3D addresses. So having given you these uh, two examples, I'd like to turn the rest over to my colleagues. Thank you very much. There are a range of existing 3D visualization platforms out there. Perhaps the most famous one is Sketchfab. And then there are also Voyager from Smithsonian and uh, 3D Viewer from Zayac. With all these existing visualization platforms in mind, Resurrect 3D is not reinventing the wheel. Here are a set of principles that we had in mind that differentiate Resurrect 3D from existing systems. First of all, Resurrect 3D is a completely open source tool built from open source libraries. Researchers and in, in institutions can essentially take our code and instantiate their own version to provide custom visualization services. And in that way, they can also control the data, which is of critical importance to the cultural heritage community. Resurrect 3D is also portable across different platforms, such as desktops, smartphones, and we have limited and ongoing support for AR and VR. And this is all due to the use of modern web technologies, which allows us to provide very similar user experience across different platforms and so users don't have to users don't have to refamiliarize themselves when porting to a different system, which is typically the case if uh, the application was developed using native libraries. Resurrect 3D also is built with cultural heritage domains specifically in mind, which means we support uh, a range of different data modalities, unique or specifically used by cultural heritage domains such as hyperspectral imaging. We also provide cultural heritage specific rendering and analysis tools, which um, we'll show you a little bit uh, in a few slides. Finally, and perhaps the most importantly, we provide a set of flexible program interfaces that allow expert users to design custom tools. And these tools could be either shading tools that allows users to visualize a model in a way that's different from the default shaders in 3JS, for instance, these tools could also be analysis tools, statistical analysis and image processing tools to process a 3D model uh, specific to um, cultural heritage artifacts. For instance, principal component analysis is typically used by uh, experts to analyze hyperspectral image data. And that kind of tool is something that expert users can easily extend and integrate into Resurrect 3D through our programming interfaces. 
which I'll show you in a few slides. So let, now let me quickly go over the overview of the Resurrect 3D systems ar ar architecture. Resurrect 3D is built on top of the classic client-server architecture, where the server is built using ExpressJS on top of MongoDB, and the client side is uh, built using React as the UI layer and 3JS as a rendering layer, with limited support for uh, WebXR to support AR-VR interactions. The, uh, what's really interesting in terms of the system architecture is how the server and the clients communicate with each other. For any initial communication, between the client and the server, between a client and the server, um, is done through the REST API, which provides high bandwidth, which is necessary for downloading the initial model, which is typically of large size. Any subsequent communications, which are mostly initiated from interactions, uh, they are communicated through WebSockets, which provide low latency communications. And one classic example is if the teacher wants to share the state, the current rendering state to students, the rendering state is typically of small data size, such as you know a few measurement and annotations, and these small data are communicated through WebSockets using um, in real time. So this is how the basic UI looks like, where the left panel is a set of the annotation um, and and uh, cultural heritage tools that uh, we'll talk about, and then the right panel is the main visualization window. Our development cycle is divided into two main phases. The first phase focuses on functionality, where the users would describe what they want to us without really specifying how the UI should look like. And then we quickly prototype a system and provide a demonstration to the users who then iteratively refine the functionality with us. Uh, when the functionality is, fin is finalized, we then move into the second phase where we focus on the UI. There, again, we quickly provide a prototype and then the users help us continuously assess the effectiveness of the UI, including the ease of use and the responsiveness. Uh, and this, the second phase, it iterates until the UI is finalized. I'm now going to walk through a few of the tools that our application offers users. Our platform supports a variety of material editing and relighting tools. Uh, depending on the specific needs of the user, a plain model lit with standard shading may not be ideal for presentation. But with our tools, um, users can fine tune the material properties and lighting to get the display exactly how they want it. Here's an example of uh, relighting and material editing applied to a wax seal. The features that are barely discernible in the original model on the left become successively clearer as more tweaks are applied. Another feature our platform supports is eye dome lighting, which is a shading method commonly employed in cultural heritage to clarify features or other points of interest. Um, here you can see an example of the method applied to a mesh of a graffito in an Italian villa. The feature of interest, which is scrawled into the surface, is barely visible with standard shading on the left, but becomes instantly recognizable when EDL is applied as it is on the right. We also support um, user added measurements and annotations, which can be used as scientific or presentation tools. The former, the measurements, allow uh, scholars to document geometric properties of objects that are too fragile to be physically measured, while the annotations allow this information and anything else of interest to be saved in a persistent note that appears in world space on the model. You can see an example of that here um, with the Hunt Lennox globe. Um, here's a note of a uh, point of interest on the actual item. And uh, these uh, notes are implemented with a combination of React UI components and 3JS rendering where screen space coordinates are projected to world space for calculations, then reprojected to screen space for dynamic user interaction as the camera navigates the screen. We also extend our markup options into a larger feature that we call storytelling. Um, this allows multiple annotations, measurements, and material and lighting settings to be chained together in sort of a 3D PowerPoint. These stories can be saved for reproduction by another user or presented seamlessly as a guided tour with a camera interpolation between points of interest, or even interrupted uh, between actual points, depending on the user's needs. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the customizability of Resurrect 3D. Um, this largely comes in two forms, um, the use of custom shaders and uh, custom image analysis tools. So why expose functionality for creating custom shaders? Uh, well, there's lots of creative shading techniques to reveal artifact details uh, that have been developed in the cultural heritage uh, imaging field. 
it's impossible and unnecessary to support all of these in one system. Uh, and these requirements may vary by users and developers. One solution that we propose is providing pro a programmable interface for developers to implement application-specific custom shaders. And behind the scenes, this leverages 3JS's capability of directly integrating GLSL shaders. So this allows developers to focus on shader design without worrying about how it's ultimately integrated into the bigger context of the application and how it shows up in the UI, as well as its interactions with the users. Um, so we do uh, provide some automatic UI integration for this. This is just a quick example of the programming interface that we've set up. So essentially, you write a function that takes a 3JS instance. Um, we then return a promise, and the promise would allow for either asynchronous or synchronous code to be called. So the reason why we chose this pattern is because you can load, a, say, a vertex shader or a fragment shader from a CDN or a server. Uh, and you can also capture your uniforms in an asynchronous manner, um, but it can also be called uh, in a synchronous fashion. So you get the best of both worlds. Um, and this way we sort of abstract away a lot of the details. So how a custom shader is integrated into the UI, um, we actually have a set of registered components uh, that users can call. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side here, um, we have this uh, add component method, uh, which is setting up a range slider um, for users to be able to toggle intensity. Um, you can also register a callback, uh, an on change callback for that component. So that's called every time the slider changes. Um, you can set min and max values. You can st set the step value. Uh, so these are just simple GUI tools that essentially you just call this add component method and they'll show up um, within the, the shader group here uh, on the left hand side of the React component. Uh, users can also create and register custom UI components um, that aren't sort of within our sort of standard core library of components. Um, but we have quite a few currently, such as a color picker, uh, the range slider that we have here, toggle buttons, um, you know, check boxes, radio buttons, uh, that sort of thing. So this is just an example of a custom shader. Uh, so this is a curtain view mode, which is a technique that uh, is borrowed from multispectral imaging. Uh, so the way we've set this up is that um, users can upload multiple textures uh, corresponding to the multispectral bands uh, of an image. Uh, and so we can render, you know, variable number of spectra here. Uh, and then based on the integrated tools, the user can essentially change the sections that they're looking at. Um, you know, move the cursor around the object and reveal the different sections based on the multi-spectral multi textures. So why do we add custom analysis tools like the curtain view? Um, well, it enables pre-processing of artifacts for better visualization and then um, eventually some post-processing for statistical image analysis. So the hope is that we can add some deep learning based vision tasks. Um, we do have generic programming interfaces for this and developers are freed from UI integration. So this is just a really simple um, pre-processing programming interface for an analysis function. So again, you have a, a 3JS object or a 3JS group, and we're using the promise pattern. So you can do any sort of asynchronous programming um, and then resolve the finished 3JS uh, object. So it's a very simple interface and you know, it allows you to do any sort of asynchronous 
programming that you want with with the object. So in the case of curtain view, uh, we are setting with the different textures, uh, the multispectral bands as different textures on the object. <clears throat> So some of the future work that we're planning on uh, is supporting AR VR platforms. So we've recently switched from web VR to web XR and, and are currently integrating that. And we're also looking into some richer storytelling capabilities through the annotation interface and beyond. And um, we're also open to the idea of enabling uh, gamification of the platform in some way. Uh, but most importantly, we welcome contributions. So anyone that's interested can feel free to contribute. So thank you again for listening to our talk and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you to the authors for the nice talk. Okay, so we have a question from our audience. Uh, not at the moment, perhaps uh, in the middle time, I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's a, see that it's a very useful, uh, powerful framework. And uh, also did you plan to, to extend the, this work, uh, testing it with more user cases uh, or uh, for example, you know, extensive evaluation of the interface Oh yeah, I mean, the main thing we're working on is to integrate that into the, uh, uh, to enable AR VR experience. And that's, and we, we want to do this through web technologies. And so WebXR is sort of the, the platform that we're gonna be building on top of. And uh, I think there are a range of different um, reasons why we need to enable AR VR technologies. And the reason, the, the, the main thing is because a lot of these um, cultural heritage artifacts are 3D by nature. And so, um, you could use your mouse to scroll around, spin around, but you know it's not as intuitive as if you were to, if, if it were to um, allow users to directly interact with it. So uh, the uh, the web XR interface is what we are primarily working on. Um, so that's clear. Thank you. And we have other question. Yes. Yeah. Can I, can I jump in? Um, we have developed our own uh, 3D viewer, so it's it called 3D Op, uh, and we spent a lot of time in making it extensible and uh, enabling people to uh, create different uh, phases out of it. And then we realized that most of the user, in the end, they never used such, um, such intense uh, customization. So most of the time, there is a different interface made use of our tool. It was made by us. What's your experience? You experience the same kind of sometime uh, this connection between the group of final user and the group of programmers that are able to extend uh, the tool? Yeah, I. so we're definitely aware of your work and uh, we had the same sort of uh, thinking, which is that there are really two types of users. One is the actual cultural heritage experts. They are not going to be doing any programming. They are just going to use whatever functionalities that you provide. And there, I think uh, the customizability is really that we provide a range of different configurations and they can configure things here and there by toggling switches and buttons. That's the not what our extensibility interfaces or extensible interfaces are primarily targeting. What we're really targeting is those, you know, developers. Like, so, you know, there could be another institution who wants to instantiate or provide their own cultural heritage serving system and they can, you know, fork our repository and then, and then develop on their own. But instead of developing from scratch, they can just use our program interface to extend it. And then, you know, their end users are going to be using their uh, uh, instanti instantiation of our repository. I, I guess, I mean, that's the sort of uh, programmer developers type of users that our uh, program interfaces are really targeting. But I, I agree that for cultural heritage experts that we work with, um, you know, they, they are not really going to program in. They, they, um, they just use whatever functionalities are available. I'm glad that you encountered the same uh, the yeah. same issue. I mean, being 
being considered when you develop it and you make it uh, customizable and modular, it's a great asset also for when you you have to use it. Of course, it makes the the, the things so much more um, clean and uh, maintainable in the future. Of course, yeah. But I'm I'm really glad that yeah, we are not alone in this uh, yeah. with this issue. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we don't have uh, other questions, uh, okay, you can go ahead. Thank you again to the speaker, to the authors. And then we can uh, go ahead to the next paper. How long do we want to maintain this hint, understand the challenges faced by web our creators? Uh, speaker here is um, Barnwood Buyer researchers at the University of Central Langsheim. And, uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Mr. Hosever, and I'll be um, making a presentation on a paper that my colleague Namdi and I worked on titled, How Long Do You Want to Maintain This Thing? Understanding the Challenges Faced by WebXR Creators. So I'm going, to be, I'm going to start by talking about what the WebXR device API is. So the WebXR API uh, makes it possible for creators to access input and output capabilities of AR and <coughs> VR devices. This can then be used to create web-based XR applications. So XR applications that can run on a web browser, um, whether it's on a mobile device or a headset or even on your desktop as long as these devices have a WebXR supported browser. So this has a number of advantages both for creators as well as users. I'm going to stick to the advantages that the WebXR device API um, provides for creators because that's what the focus of this uh, work is on. So for creators, the WebXR allows the creation of cross-platform XR applications. So you create a single um, XR application that can be run on a mobile device or a headset. <clears throat> um, it also allows creators to use existing WebGL um, development tools, so things like um, so libraries like uh, 3GS, which have been used, which have been used uh, for several years for creating 3D uh, programs on the web, can be used to create Web XR applications. And it also allows for the creation of future-proof XR applications, meaning that um, it is expected that future XR devices will come with WebXR support out of the box. And so theoretically, um, WebXR applications that are created now will be able to be used on future WebXR application, uh, on future XR um, devices. And because these are applications that are, that are that run on the browser, uh, they can be shared easily using URLs. So um, creators can easily share their um, applications and they can be accessed and shared easily by users. And then finally, WebXR applications can be experienced in either VR or AR with minimal code changes. So this study was conducted with the aim of understanding the experiences of WebXR creators. Now, similar studies have been conducted and um, some focused on the experiences of um, specific XR uh, applica uh, application creators. Uh, for example, studies exist on the, uh, that looked at the experience of AR creators. There are also studies that looked at the experiences of both AR and VR creators. However, none of these looked specifically at the experiences of WebXR creators or compared um, them with the experiences of native creators. So we conducted the study with a, um, with a focus on WebXR as the XR development platform, and we considered the experiences of both AR and VR creators. Um, we hope that our findings um, start a discussion on the situation of WebXR, um, it being a new development platform and all, um, and hopefully lead to discussions about how to resolve the challenges that we've uh, uncovered. So 
Um, the data collection for this study um, were conducted between May and June of 2021. Um, we recruited participants through um, several social media platforms, uh, specifically Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and LinkedIn. And we looked for, <coughs> excuse me, and we looked for individuals that have created WebXR applications or are currently creating WebXR applications. We use the WebXR hashtag on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn to identify posts and then contact the authors of those posts um, and invite them to participate in the study. On Facebook and Reddit, we uh, posted adverts to the study uh, in the web XR, web VR, and the immersive web communities. We successfully um, recruited 11 participants to participate in the study, and these participants are from all over the world, as you can see um, in the table that, <coughs> excuse me, as you can see in the table that uh, that gives a brief, brief profile of these participants. Um, they use a variety of different tools to create AR and VR experiences, and the uh, the yes that they have in terms of experience working with WebXR also varies. So in general, we have a diverse set of participants that took part in the study. So we use semi-structured interviews conducted with each one of these participants to collect data, and the interviews were transcribed and analyzed using thematic analysis to identify um, themes in the experiences reported by these participants. So three major themes were identified from our data analysis. So the first is the motivation um, for parties, for these creators to use WebXR um, rather than native. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And then um, we found the challenges that these creators faced when they were using, uh, while using WebXR. And then finally, um, we also identified the different approaches um, used by these creators uh, to tackle cross-platform support for their WebXR applications. <coughs> so in this uh, in in this in this paper, we mainly focus on, on reporting the challenges that the that our participants reported associated with creating WebXR applications. So the first challenge I'm going to talk about is the challenge associated with learning to use the WebXR device API. And this was a challenge faced by most of the participants of the study, including those that have spent several years working on uh, working with WebXR. So the issue that was mostly reported was that there was a lack of learning resources for, uh, for learning to use WebXR uh, and the tools and frameworks for developing web XR applications. And the tool, the resources that are available are not properly curated, which means in order for, uh, in order for interested uh, parties to find them, they have to conduct a thorough research on the internet. So this, is, this issue is associated with the second challenge we identified, which is the lack of awareness amongst developers and also users. So the WebXR developer community is a very small one, and that's because there is a lack of awareness surrounding WebXR device API. Even though there are several millions of JavaScript developers, because there is little awareness around WebXR, these JavaScript developers, even though they have the tools and experience that can allow them to create a WebXR application, do not know of its existence and so are not part of the WebXR developer community. And in addition to lack of awareness around developers, users are also not aware of Web, what WebXR is and that's also a challenge, that also creates a challenge for creators trying to explain what WebXR is to users and how accessible it is, how it differs to native, and how it can be used uh, in, in contexts that are relevant to those users. There were also challenges um, that are associated with um, WebXR applications 
um, and their nature and the nature of browser-based applications in general. So the first is the performance limitations of browsers. So browsers are not as good as native. So browser-based applications are not going to be as fast as uh, performant. Uh, they're not going to do as much heavy lifting as native applications are going to do. And this leads to extra tasks that creators have to perform to ensure that their application is um, optimized. So these can be things like um, getting draw calls down, getting the material count down, um, managing number of items in a scene, which are all good practices that should be done anyways. But for WebXR uh, application creators, these are tasks that must be done in order to make sure that an application is not, for example, very choppy. Then, <laughs> There is the issue of having different levels of support for the WebXR API uh, on different browsers. Um, there's, there's a sort of fragmented support for the WebXR device API across browsers on different um, WebXR supported devices. And this creates a challenge because it, it makes the WebXR platform a very slow moving one, um, where at any given time, there is no consistency in the support uh, for the API amongst all, uh, all current browsers. And this means that it's difficult to create state-of-the-art XR experiences that work on every, um, every device's uh, browser. This then makes uh, web XR creators to sort of play it safe and go for features that they know are going to work on every device's browser even if that's not going to create the most or the best experience for their users and then finally um, there is the issue associated with keeping up with updates so the web is an ever-evolving um, platform so there are always going to be updates uh, for for browsers um, development tools development de development frameworks and even the the WebXR API itself can be updated. It is going to be updated. And this can break uh, WebXR applications or expose them to security threats. This means that when you're working on a WebXR project, um, you can never truly finish working on that project. You're basically on a journey that depends on how long you want to keep maintaining the project. Lastly, we have a set of challenges that were reported by users when discussing the cross-platform support offered by WebXR. The first is the challenge caused by differences in hardware and software across WebXR supported devices. So although WebXR application can run on all WebXR supported devices, the experience of users may vary depending on the device the users are using. This makes it hard for creators to create consistent experiences for users regardless of their devices. Another challenge associated with cross-platform support is lack of iOS support for WebXR. At the moment, Apple's Safari web browser does not support WebXR. And according to the creators that participated in our study, this is a barrier to mainstream acceptance and, cross and complete cross-platform support. Lastly, there is the challenge associated with testing. So the first challenge associated with testing web XR applications is that there are a large number of web XR supported devices and access to these devices can be difficult. And even when there is access to these devices, small teams or lone developers may not have the resources needed in order to test their application on all web XR supported devices. There is also the difficulty, the tediousness, the discomfort associated with the iterative process of testing applications on a device such as a headset and then tweaking your code or making changes on a desktop. This continuous iterative process can be very slow, uncomfortable and challenging. 
So with all that said, we believe that moving forward, there are several things that needs to be that need to be done in order to move WebXR um, forward. First of all, there needs to be um, first of all, learning resources for WebXR and its development tools need to be developed and more importantly curated so that they can be easily accessed by interested creators. And then there needs to be uh, a move towards developing and sharing guidelines for creating and maintaining consistent web XR applications. Uh, there needs to be development of tools and guidelines for testing web XR applications for all web XR devices. And we also think it is very, we believe it is very important that web XR is not considered as a competing platform to native, but rather as a complementing platform. We also believe there should be um, there should be a drive towards promoting awareness amongst developer groups, including the more than 12 million JavaScript developers worldwide. There should also be a drive towards promoting awareness around web XR amongst users and also a move towards identifying ideal use cases for web XR applications. This can truly help in, con in seeing web XR as a complementing platform to native if we can figure out the ideal use cases where web xr uh, where web xr is a more fitting platform than native and then finally we believe that it is very important that moving forward web xr is advertised with full transparency For the presentation. Okay, yes, sir. Ah, okay, I can find the. Okay. I want to say something uh, about uh, to, to, to the also to the spectators. So more than a question to the to the authors was uh, something to promote uh, discussion. Also, the, the reviewer that uh, who judged this, this paper uh, found that it, it struck home on uh, many considerations about WebXR. So as, as developers, that they found the same, uh, they found that their own issue uh, described in, the, in this paper. Uh, during the conference in these days, we had uh, different uh, uh, talks about WebXR that seems to become the new the, the, the ideal standard for some platform, especially this meta stuff that is becoming the, the next buzzword of, the, of this conference and not only of this conference, I fear. And uh, so I, I believe this, this work can be a good starting point for a discussion in the community and also for the people now connected uh, about the state of, of WebXR. So Neil Trivet uh, the first day showed how OpenXR has become a standard on most of the hardware platform and software platform. So this hopefully should solve a least some of the issue uh, that were mentioned in this uh, in this paper but it's it was clear also from his um, interesting presentation the first day you can find the record on the website blah, 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 uh, that we are still ongoing in this uh, in this process so uh, probably as the author said the the community has to step up at the moment and provide better example, better tutorial, better to come out filling the gap of the WebXR experience at the, at the moment, since it's becoming so important. So thank you again for the, to the authors. Just wanted to point out this theme for the entire audience. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. Otherwise, I I have a question too. I I am not uh, sorry. I'm not a user of uh, WebXR, but uh, I could. So I was just interested 
about uh, spherical and equirectangular images. Thus, they are support by WebXR, the equirectangular and spherical projection uh, as a stereoscopic view or even a monoscopic view of uh, spherical images or equirectangular images. Sorry, sorry, you went off for a bit. I, I didn't catch the question. Could you repeat it? Sorry. Uh, yes, I was just asking if, uh, okay, uh, equirectangular images or spherical uh, panoramic images uh, are uh, well supported in uh, WebXR or, uh, or how are uh, supported? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, so. So, for example, A-Frame, one of the most um, popular um, frameworks for developing web XR applications, you could easily use that to add, um, to add, yeah, and, uh, to add images. Um, so you could add them as just a single images. You could add them. Um, I think they are what they are things called primitives that you could use to add um, to add images, um, so that you can create things like a, like a skybox. Um, so it's so there are there are primitives for those sort of things. Um, I so Aframe, yeah, it, it is a very good tool that you can use for those sort of things. So it, it, and easily add it to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, if uh, you have other questions from the projectors, no audience chat. Uh, we don't. Okay. Thank you again to the speaker and the authors for the nice talk and uh, for the discussion. Uh, uh, if we don't have other points to discuss, I think the session is going to close. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. As the organizers say, okay, discussion can okay, continue on the on the application. Okay, and uh, for the chat and the speaker. Okay. So I'm going to close the, the session. Thank you to the speakers and authors and also the organizers to invite me to the session. Thank you again. And uh, okay, see you for the <laughs> closure session. So. So thank you to anyone who participated. Thanks to the to the chair, and we will have some um, a bit of a pause because the next session is at five. Be there because there are the the best paper awards. There are the showcase by the by the audience and uh, the, the closure session. All the things that you normally find in a closure session will be there. So thanks everyone, and let's see you in. Um, uh, three quarter of hour at uh, at five in the same uh, chat. Bye.